to the CBC, CBN, CBG, and more panel. Discussions about what are these molecules? How can we get them? What is the future that we can, if we're all prophets up here, we can tell what will come, but what don't we know? That is the core of science is the unknown. So panel, introduce yourselves, your name, your maybe profession, you're in cannabis, and what you want to bring to this discussion. Sorry. All right, um, so I'm Dr. Tyrell Toll. I have a maybe PhD you can, in, you can bring that closer. in medicinal natural products chemistry uh, from the University of Iowa, ironically. Uh, and um, so I've actually been working in cannabis for about five, just over five years now. Um, I got started um, in Washington State just after um, Colorado and, and Washington State had legalized adult use cannabis. Um, I worked initially on novel extraction methods, um, which led to a patent on ethylacetate extraction of cannabis. Um, I also worked in a cannabis quality assurance laboratory for a year and a half, so I was involved, heavily involved with it. The last two years I've been at MedFarm Holdings, um, which uh, is a vertically integrated manufacturer here in Colorado, so we grow, um, extract, purify, and uh, formulate our, uh, all in-house, um, so we have total control over our product. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, I've been developing the chemistries, um, both extraction and analytical chemistries there for the past couple of years. Uh, my, name, my name is Josh Jones. Uh, I work for myself. Uh, I run a company called Jonesing Labs. Uh, and I, I have a PhD in organic chemistry, so I've been using that skill set in both the hemp and the marijuana industry for the past four and a half years or so. Uh, since getting out of the graduate program, but I largely have been involved in process design uh, and process improvement for the extraction and refining and, and purification of components uh, from cannabis. Uh, the company that I operate now is really available to people setting up new operations or existing operations uh, that need some help with research and development, and, and that's what I really enjoy is, is answering questions through experiments. So I, uh, I provide services on a contract basis for organizations that don't necessarily have the staff or the time or the just whatever bandwidth to perform their own R&D in-house. So it, it's, it's a pleasure to work with different producers to work on their processes and in general just to build the industry uh, through those avenues. Um, hi, my name is Anna Schwabe and I just finished my PhD in cannabis genetics and I work for Mile High Labs now is their research coordinator. Um, and I guess I got interested in cannabis um, around the time it was legalized in Colorado and I had a friend who uh, found this amazing strain that she really enjoyed. Um, but she, no matter where she went, she couldn't find the original one and everything wasn't the same as that one that she found. And I was like, that's really weird because at the time, knowing very little about cannabis, but I did know that they were mostly clones. And with my background in um, population genetics, I was like, well, I can answer that question. So um, I approached my PI and I asked him if he would be interested in doing this project, and he said, nope, not doing that. <laughs> and um, I finally convinced him that this was a good project. And so basically my dissertation work was on variation in cannabis with a background in genetics. So I looked at phenotypes and how that relates to the genetic profiles. Um, my name is Julie Fry. My background's in biochemistry, pharmacology, and quality management systems. I'm a consultant in the industry, um, and I think you'll find more out about me as we go on. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Sean Colvin. I work for Treehouse Biotech as a uh, research scientist, um, and we're a two-prong company doing both you know, extraction and, and B2B wholesale of CBD and, and the extracts, and then we also have a research program um, really focused at getting after some of these minor cannabinoids, uh, accessing them, and then hopefully uh, starting to learn a little bit more about them medicinally. Uh, so my, 
my background is in uh, organic chemistry, um, so I think my <laughs> Complement nice. some of the other uh, chemical knowledge on this panel, uh, and I've been working on this for about a year and a half now, uh, towards accessing some of these molecules. Okay, thank you, panelists. Uh, let's do this like popcorn, starting with CBC, CBN, CBG, and that that's the thing is we get feedback once the I've been tussling with these. Um, does anyone on the panel have any insight they would like to share about CBC specifically? Any, anything about CBC that we can start? All right. Well, I think it's going to be the most accessible uh, in terms of both uh, having phenotypes that express it as perhaps not the major, but uh, increased into, concentrations into the mic. Uh, so CBC, I, I would expect, would be one of the first, if, if not the first, that we can extract and purify directly from the plant material. And that's interesting, uh, as opposed to uh, other examples like CBN. It's not something that can be directly extracted unless it's for an old plant material, as CBN is a degradation product of delta-9 THC. Uh, so CBC being an endogenous cannabinoid for the plant uh, with enzymes identified, I think has the most potential for evaluation uh, in the coming year. I'm going to follow up what you said with enzymes identified. Can you fill us in on what that means? Sure. So it, as far as I understand, and I'm, I'm not a, a plant uh, biologist, but if an enzyme is identified in an organism that's associated with the expression of a secondary metabolite like the cannabinoids, then that enzyme can be depended on to perform genetic modification on perhaps yeast or bacteria to express that cannabinoid or secondary metabolite uh, through different means. And it's, okay. it's simply another way to expand the study of something where the, the available plant genetics may not be feasible or economic or extractive. So like a synthase, a exactly. protein so that CBC folds synthase. the CBG into Correct. CBC. That, Correct. Uh, that piece of genetic code has been identified has, has been identified to my knowledge there's just been three uh, cannabinoid synthases identified THC CBD uh, and, and, and CBC CBC. okay CBG of course is the is the precursor to all of those so the right for CBG as well right has been identified okay any more insights on CBC specifically I, I just think it's a it's a whacked out molecule you look at that genetic stru or the molecular structure and it's like that doesn't look like THC or CBC it's like a completely different thing well uh, a different cyclization so you have two rings uh, in CBC and you have three rings in THC right so there's a different way that CBC cyclizes and that's due to the, the shape of the protein or the synthase that converts CBG into CBC or THC or CBD right and I think we can naturally go right into CBN. You already mentioned uh, that CBN is a degradation product. Does anyone have any thoughts specifically about CBN? Well, I think there's, I have one little piece on CBC for you. Okay, yeah. Uh, so while most of these compounds haven't had a whole lot of research um, directly uh, because of isolation problems for one and expression problems and just getting enough material is difficult so there haven't been a lot of studies that um, have tested these minor cannabinoids directly against disease states or cell lines um, however I did come across a, a, a article that's uh, ahead of publication but they have confirmed that CBC is a CB2 receptor Agonist, so that'll be interesting to see how that guides, um, you know, its uh, potential uses uh, medicinally uh, as it goes on. Uh, CBN, uh, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal stories about it helping with sleep. Um, as far as I know, it's less psychoactive than, than THC. I think 20% of the psychoactivity is the number I saw. Um, but uh, I, I'm also not aware of any actual clinical trials or studies that have been performed with CBN to confirm that it is uh, helping with sleep. You, I want to follow up on something you said. You said that 
CBC has been shown to be an agonist for the CB2 receptor. Um, I guess just fill us, fill us in. I happen to know, because I've been doing this for years, but what is the CB2 receptor and what does it mean? <laughs> Off the top of my head, I'm not going to probably be able to tell you the difference between, uh, you know, the, the pharmacologies of CB1 and CB2, um, but cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2, G-protein coupled receptors, um, so they're transmembrane receptors found in the cell, cell uh, uh, excuse me, this, the membrane, so that they can receive signals from outside of the cell and then transmit those signals inside of the cell. Um, so that's why uh, THC, even though it stays on the outside of the cell, it will it'll interact with these receptors and send signals, which you know, ultimately results in a you know, euphoric effect and other effects as well. Um, so they're yeah, they're just transmembrane receptors that uh, that uh, in nerves, because you talked about transmitting between cells. That sounds like a nerve cell into, to me. So it's not always a nerve thing. So it can be just an intracellular signal that can be uh, initiated so that that cell knows what to do or how to behave, I guess, um, adjusting to its extracellular environment. It is found in uh, the nervous system, so it can, you know, then in turn affect its downstream signals to other nerve cells, but it's also found in the digestive system where those cells are just receiving a signal from THC or CBC or, or whatever molecule and then um, that's altering the um, internal behavior of the cell, if you will, um, to determine its, uh, the state it's in. So. Anything else from the panel? Well, I think that it, one kind of uh, easy distinguishing mark between CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors could be that you think of CB1 as in the brain and CB2 as outside of the brain and CB1 being named the first one was uh, identified as something being activated by Delta-9 THC. And CB2 is not as much activated by Delta-9, but more activated by, from what we've seen, perhaps CBC and definitely uh, CBD. Uh, but the CB2 receptors seem more to be located outside of the central nervous system and more in the nervous system outside of the brain and the immune system. Immune. So there's some yeah. speculative uh, uses of CB2 agonists and antagonists to affect the immune system and uh, perhaps in what is increasingly a concern uh, is the immune system attacking the body. Um, so elderly people more frequently are diagnosed with immunodeficiencies, not being AIDS, but something where the immune system is, is acting strange. I myself am an autoimmune disease sufferer. It's what I use cannabis for. There we go. So that, I mean, oh, and I, I also wanted to follow up that some very good insights. Uh, you were talking about CB1 receptor being in the brain, CB2 being elsewhere in the body. As I understand, at least with THC, in order to get high from eating THC, it needs to be decarboxylated so that it can penetrate the blood-brain barrier and get in to the brain. Right. If the receptors that these cannabinoids are targeting are outside the brain, does it follow that they do not require decarboxylation to be bioactive? What do you think? Uh, it's an interesting question. I don't know exactly, but it's nice to talk about. Uh, as far as I've understood, there, there's a few different pathways that the decarboxylation, the uh, a few different Thank pathways you. that decarboxylation of cannabinoids can cause the increase in uptake and increase in activity. Uh, one of those is being the gut. So if you ingest a cannabinoid, an acidic cannabinoid into the gut, there's less likelihood that it's gonna pass through the wall of the gut into the bloodstream than the neutral cannabinoids. So the acidic cannabinoids have found some uh, evidence that they could be useful in treating, for example, Crohn's disease mm -hmm. or irritable bowel syndrome because they can stay in the gut and affect the cells that are in the gut. Uh, whereas decarboxylation allows the systemic uh, uh, availability. Mm -hmm. of, the, of the neutral cannabinoid. Thank you, that's some good insights. All right, moving on now to CBG, the god molecule, the grandpapa of them all. Uh, are there any, any thoughts or insights, just 
raise your hand if you have any and uh, anything to say about CBG. Where does it come from? Where? What? I guess what about CBG? Anything? Maybe from this side of the panel. It's been a heavy on that side of the panel. We got to be balanced. Yeah, I might just share a personal opinion, not so much in my expertise, but I think opinions are fine sure. here. <laughs> That's why you're on uh, the panel. I, th I think CBG kind of represents to me one of the most um, interesting and accessible molecules to get from uh, an organism, be it the plant or expression, being that it's at the front of the uh, biosynthetic pathway. It means the least amount of enzymes to, you know, um, <coughs> excuse me, express in yeast or E. coli or something like that. Uh, so I think it actually, uh, it's very interesting from that respect that it is the I don't know. I'm not going to use God molecule. Uh, it's just CBG. <laughs> There's but, a G. But just, yeah, but just the fact that it's a precursor, I think it is kind of the most exciting from those aspects of, of accessing these molecules, uh, maybe not directly from the plant. Um, just out of its simplicity, it's, it's less complicated to do that than in another organism. Uh, but I think also, um, you know, the, the because it is the precursor to a lot of other cannabinoids, many of which may not have a biological pathway, and they are, in fact, just degradation of other cannabinoids. Accessing CBG uh, could then allow for controlled degradation to other cannabinoids not listed on this panel. Um, I, I think that's kind of the most, one of the most exciting things about CBG is you're starting at, at the you know, point zero, and that allows you scientifically to move forward uh, without having to kind of re-engineer something. And it's crystalline, so everybody <laughs> likes Much crystal. To to <laughs> CBG is a crystal, apparently. <laughs> Anything else? I was going to say oh. CBG is one of the um, hottest commodities in the, 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 the growing world. Like everybody's looking for high CBG strains, clones, seeds. Mm. There's not a lot available out there, um, but breeders are coming up with new high CBG types and trying to get them out there. So I really think in the few, next few years, we're going to start seeing some higher CBG strains and um, that's pretty exciting. Uh, and there is a natural, oh, well, there, so everyone's heard of sour diesel, I'm assuming. There is two forms of sour diesel and one of those is higher in CBG, which is interesting and some of the genetic companies are looking at those two variants to try and figure out um, where that gene is located, because um, the, the, the genome is really complicated in cannabis, and it's um, been a heck of a time trying to put that all together and find the locations of genes, even putting the chromosomes together has been a challenge, so um, I think medicinal genomics is in the forefront of that, and they've almost got the genome assembled, so being able to figure out where these synthase genes are located and how these expressions are um, how these expression levels are, are being produced in the plant will also play into that. Yeah, I, I uh, thank you for the insight. Thank you, Anna. Sure. And um, you said earlier that there, it's earlier in the process that there are fewer biomechanical steps to make CBG than it is to make DHC, for example, or CBD. Does it? And I'm, I'm, I'm honestly curious, I was wondering if you guys have seen any evidence of this. Does it follow that there's a higher percentage of CBG in the flower earlier in the flowering process? Have you seen any evidence of this? To me, it makes sense, but I haven't seen any data. What do you guys think? I actually know that um, some cultivators will uh, harvest their crop early if they want to yield, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, higher levels of CBG in their products. So, so yes. that's already a practice mm -hmm. yes. in the industry. Yes, yeah, some people are getting away from like mm -hmm. maximum THC because people are starting to want that, that whole panel of different cannabinoids and having a higher CBG, perhaps, you know, not letting it go all the way to THC and then harvesting, they're kind of pulling them early to get a better, you know, spectrum of different cannabinoids. But the buds don't look as photogenic. And they're not as big. They're not as big. They don't look like the magazine photos. Do you think? Do you think there's a image in people's head of what a ripe 
bud is that is perhaps hindering well, the trichomes, cloud? Right? Everybody knows you've got to harvest when the trichomes. <laughs> when a certain <laughs> percentage of the trichomes are cloudy? Yep, and, what? The, and the studios yeah. are um, amber. Right, 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 right. That's <laughs> smell test. The nose always knows, Anna. <laughs> Um, okay, and now moving on, and I think this, this follows perfectly because and more is the last subject, and CBG, you mentioned that the creation of CBG has high potential for the creation of other cannabinoids, not ones even listed here. Can you go on about that? Or can you talk about that? Other cannabinoids? Anyone? Bueller? There's lots, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, the oxidative degradation products of, we could say, all the cannabinoids produced in the plant uh, can represent diverse bioactivity, but we don't know, really, how they can affect the body. Uh, so it's a bit of a danger to propose the new synthesis or isolation and delivery to the market of degradants of cannabinoids produced in the plant, and degradant could mean CBN as a degradant of, of delta-9 THC, or it could even be the isomers of delta-9, like delta-8 or delta-10 or delta-6 uh, THC, or it could represent other uh, identified cannabinoids at first thought to come from the plant, but it turns out not, uh, such as a degradant of CBD, I believe cannabis cyclol, CBC, or perhaps I'm mistaken, and it's CBE, cannabis elsin, thank you. Uh, so there's multiple synthetic pathways available through the work to identify the structure of these molecules, that are being used right now to attempt production at, at commercial scale. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the best way to go about uh, the ex exploration of, of novel cannabinoids, at least uh, being ingested by a broad uh, body. Let's not even say patient body, just broad body of people. Uh, but it's being done, and it will, over the next year, I think, show a lot of different activities or lack of activities in what's available to the market from the plant and through other synthetic methods to alter uh, the structure of cannabinoids. And I, I would like to build on that. So traditionally we've gone after THC. That was the, the one. Now come CBD. This, this is the next big thing, right? And those two molecules are produced in the acidic forms in quantity. There's a whole bunch of other cannabinoids that are just produced in small amounts. And I think that there are probably cannabinoids that are produced in small amounts but have a very um, a much higher pharmacological effect on us, but we haven't really looked at them because they're not in those, you know, amounts where we can extract them. And so if you're trying to extract something like, let's say, CBC, it's, you know, you're going to spend a lot of effort extracting it to get this little tiny amount, which isn't really what a, a lab is going to want to be going after because you end up with, here's a grain of <laughs> CBC, I'm going to go out and sell this. But it could have, you know, extremely potent physiological effects on us, and we just don't know because we haven't been looking. Um, so I think that, you know, we need to ha have caution if we're going to be doing these extractions, you know, and, and we're, do you know, we recommend what, like 10 milligrams of THC or CBD. Recommending something like 10 milligrams of CBN is probably not a good idea. Hmm. Because I think I mean, those I, things are out on the market. I know a one-to-one -one CBN, CBN like to CBD ratio product CBD. is out there in CBN the market. CBN is much more potent than, than CBD. Yes, for sure. but we don't know anything about CBD. You, I mean, do you think CBD might hamper the effects like it does allegedly with well, THC? The entourage effect. Can the entourage effect. It does. That is and more. <laughs> that entourage effect. That. I, I guess I, I, I want to hear your thoughts about this because the way we've been talking has been in the framing that has been set forth by the pharmaceutical industry. That a drug is and only is a specific molecule that does a specific biological thing. So, yeah, go. Can, can I just, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna jump in here. <coughs> so. Um, I, I kind of have uh, some contention uh, with the term entourage because entourage implies that there is one star in the show and then it's got like an entourage of other molecules that are highlighting its special abilities. Um, so I, I, 
have the tendency to reject that term and instead use ensemble because uh, I think that rather than an entourage of cannabis plant, the cannabis plant works like a, a symphony and a concert of molecules all working together um, without any particular highlight on any particular molecule. So that actually brings me back to the term minor cannabinoids. So I don't know if any of you out there have read or seen The Botany of Desire, but the mm. cannabis plant as we know it now has been shaped by humanity. Mm. So we don't actually know how, and that's why uh, there's such a huge hunt for what are called land races, because people, we're now seeking out, well, what was the plant, what was the plant like in its chemical constitution before humanity got its hands on it? I don't know if that will be, if it will be possible to determine that at this stage in time, um, but I, I would say that the way that we view the cannabis plant now with a very THC-centric fo focus has to do with the fact that its cultivation was widely repressed and oppressed. And what that means, and take alcohol as an example, is when you prohibit or prevent people from getting their hands on any specific substance or uh, plant or fungi or whatever, what then happens is the quote unquote active constituents uh, become more concentrated and more, um, you could use the term potent, but I'll just say more concentrated. So that's what happened with alcohol when it was prohibited. Moonshine became the most prevalent type of drink found. Um, and as soon as the prohibition was repealed, then uh, all of a sudden you've got spritzers and wine spirits and all sorts of stuff. I don't know, I don't drink because I'm an alcoholic. So um, <laughs> that's actually why I use cannabis as a prophylactic. But anyway. They, they um, had methanol available for people to drink I, I back when I'd it was prohibited. That, yeah. Um, it was dangerous. It is dangerous, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, so the point is that's the same thing that happened with cannabis. And as the cannab as cannabis cultivation moved underground, uh, we saw an increase in the, the amount of THC A produced by the plant. Um, and actually, I was going to say something else, but I kind of got derailed. By <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I just I've been thinking about this so-called uh, vape crisis, and what a powerful recommendation that is towards legalization yeah. so that we don't have what is analogous to methanol on the market and people dying you don't see large groups of people dying from tainted alcohol no but anymore. you still you still do see um uh knock off alcohol like there n we just have to come to terms i think as humans uh that people will there will always be people who will try to do things without integrity and um, and I, I think that uh, yeah and I think that you know you'll, you're gonna see you, just as you still see counterfeit alcohol products on the market you will still see probably counterfeit uh, teach or cannabis products on the market even with full-blown legalization so um, I think what's most important is that everybody takes responsibility personally for their own health and well-being by doing the research and the due diligence on the products that they intend to purchase and or asking ex quote unquote experts because I don't really <laughs> believe that there's experts in this field um, somebody who maybe has more knowledge or, or um, uh, experience in this industry than they do so what if I were to say that all this is wrong-headed, that we shouldn't even be thinking of individual cannabinoids, but ought to be thinking of ratios? Um, I, 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 well, I disagree. You disagree? I disagree. So, she okay, disagrees. So I'm going to give my cake analogy. <laughs> so cake analogy. My cake analogy. OK, so if you have a cake, right, we know what eggs are. Eggs are good. We know what milk is. Milk is good. Oil, oil, good. Butter, good. Vanilla, good. Um, if I gave you all of these ingredients and said, here, make a cake, you'd go, how? Like, how much of each do I put in here? You could guess, but how do you know you're going to come up with a cake versus a cookie versus a hot mess? Um, you don't. So I think that each individual constituent is important in and of itself, but also the way you put those things together is also important and you can end up with very different things depending on how you put those constituents together so that's not really we're not really disagreeing actually really? but yeah no okay. um, 
Um, I, don't, I, I just would, I would say, I think this kind of goes back to uh, the point I was making about how we don't actually know what the plant's original constitution was. So we can, we can fracture the plant and uh, isolate its individual constituents. And we do know what the function is in, uh, pharmacologically for a lot of those, CBG and CBC and uh, THCV and CBDV. Um, there's some great papers by a man named Ethan Russo. Um, yeah, and I would really recommend, I mean, I could regurgitate the whole paper to you, but I feel like, you know, you might be better served just reading it yourself. Um, so uh, one is called, the most recent one with uh, Jehan Marku is called The Usual Suspects. That one's fantastic. And Taming THC is another one that I really enjoy. And, um, and they talk about the pharmacological effects of some of the quote-unquote minor cannabinoids. Um, but so what I would say is that, yes, sure, you can reconstitute uh, the individual constituents and then it will provide probably or elicit different effects. Um, in accordance with the ratios of those constituents and also your individual biochemistry. So it's the other thing that we need to recall is that this plant interacts with each one of us differently. Um, and so there's so many variables and it will really just come down to a matter of the products being made available on the market and then self-titration. So. Yeah. Do you think that we're lacking a blood test of the endocannabinoid system? No, it's really easy. It's, it's really, really easy, actually, to it's really easy to test your anandamide and uh, two arachidinoyl glycerol levels. Um, you you. That's two AG. Two AG. Okay. Yeah, sorry, two AG and an anandamide. Okay, so uh, arachidinoyl ethanolamine is AEA for short, and it's also called anandamide. Anandamide um, is ananda is the Hindu word for bliss. So it's your literal bliss molecule, and it's the one that binds to the CB1 receptor, which uh, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol is the um, plant analog for that, for AEA. And then 2-AG, 2-arachidinoyl glycerol, is uh, the primary endocannabinoid, endogenous cannabinoid, so endogenously in your body produced, uh, that binds to the CB2 receptor. Um, yeah. Yeah, so actually, this Thank you. brings up a good topic. Uh, I mean, besides just... Uh, cannabinoid receptor 1 and cannabinoid receptor 2, that's not necessarily the entire endocannabinoid system. That's just what we've discovered so far. So it's really exciting to see that uh, G protein coupled receptor 55, GPR 55, has been identified to interact with different cannabinoids. So, and N119. then, and then, uh, uh, N119. Okay, yeah. yeah. N119, I guess. So, and then, but, and then these, these cannabinoids are so diverse in structure. There's 140, over 140 identified cannabinoids with diverse structures. So not all of them are necessarily going to act on the cannabinoid, the classical cannabinoid receptors. They, they may even be acting on uh, many, many other receptors. There's thousands within your body. So uh, it's really just the tip of the iceberg to be talking about CB1 and CB2. And, and there's a lot of uh, exciting uh, research that needs to be done. And then the, the combinations. So we talk about an ensemble or entourage effect. Um, it's going to take a lot of research to test all these combinations, and it's almost overwhelming to think, where do you even start? Um, so, uh, well, maybe with, you know, federal legalization and making it possible to research. More God. research. Yeah. More research <laughs> is needed. Uh, that would be a start, but... Um, yeah. I would just, um, if I could just add in one thing too, um, we're, we're only talking about cannabinoid receptors when we're talking about the GPR uh, 55 and 119 and CB1 and CB2, and there are a few other uh, putative receptors that are have been identified. Um, but what uh, is also noteworthy is that the cannabinoids also interact with um, the TRIP receptors, um, and they also interact with opioid receptors, indirectly serotonin receptors. So they interact with a bunch of other different receptor systems, either directly or indirectly. So we're not even only looking at one specific receptor system. We're looking at how all of these receptor systems uh, interplay. Please, please inform us yeah, who are less informed. What is What are TRIP receptors? Yeah, I don't even know what that is. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, I, th I think the acronym is uh, transient receptor vanilla, transient, re uh, transient receptor potential vanilloid receptor, something like that. Transient potential, something like that, right? It's an acronym. Vanilla I know it's a vanilloid receptor, but it's transient receptor potential vanilloid something. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I got that right. Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> Somebody's Googling it right now. <laughs> yeah. But uh, those ones um, have a lot to do with uh, controlling inflammation in the body. Mm. Yes. Wow. Okay. We're so efficient. I might add. Uh, oh, and yeah, there's so much <laughs> more to say. Uh, d just to, I don't know, I guess shine a slightly different perspective on this. I mean, I think the, I, I don't disagree with anything said here. Uh, one thing I would say is just depending on the venue of interest, uh, you know, the, the ensemble effect might be much more interesting or, mu or much more important in terms of pharmacology and things like that. Uh, I think on a basic research side, it actually is very beneficial to focus on a single molecule. Um, you know, maybe not so much with a, a direct eye to uh, the pharmacology or the, the end biological result, but in terms of identifying, right, a lot of these very specific roles these molecules play, it is so much easier to find that out with one ingredient. Oh. Um, and, 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 then, and then using that to identify what might be happening in the concert. Uh, and then also, if we can access a lot of these other cannabinoids that might hit something that we don't know it hits, I mean, like, really to identify that, you, if you just use it and you can identify these brand new targets that might be, you know, again, it's probably not the right term, but side players or, or just um, non-identified players in the endocannabinoid system, using single molecules to find those, and then informing what might be going on in the ensemble is a really valuable basic research um, perspective. And, and so I think it's, you know, there's never going to be one right way to look at it. It depends on where you're coming from. It depends on where you want to get to. But I, I, I just wanted to throw out that there is still a lot of value in, you know, even though that there's a lot of problems in the pharmaceutical industry, the, the single molecule focus on a basic research level certainly has its merit in, in certain circumstances. So, sorry, just to jump in and before, okay, so, um, yes, I, I, I don't know if you guys um, follow research journals, uh, but Daniele Piomelli uh, is one of the uh, chief editors for, um, I think it's Cannabis and Cannabis Research. Uh, it's a, the um, cannabis-based research journal in the U.S. that publish, publishes research articles related to cannabis. and. Um, he is a big proponent of single molecule solutions for uh, complex, in my opinion, pharmacological, uh, pharmacological problems. And so I was saying to him that although I think that single molecules, monomolecules, are fantastic research tools for uh, understanding better the molecular mechanisms that, um, th that, that occur in the body, I don't necessarily think that those are the same things that should be used to try to solve those problems because they're complex problems. So I agree with you, they're fantastic research tools. Use single molecules to figure out what pathway is doing what, and that's, that's great. But um, I always use the weightlifting metaphor. Uh, if you're trying to improve your, your squat, uh, just do more squats. But like, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you just training one specific quadricep muscle. Like, if that's your weak point, like, it, it doesn't make any sense uh, in, in terms of fixing the problem as a whole. So, yeah. And going along with the cake analogy <coughs> that perhaps we can think of these individual cannabinoids not as drugs, but as ingredients. Ingredients that are mixed together at the right proportion in response to your blood test, say. And there are two endocannabinoids mentioned already on the panel do you do you think those are the primary endocannabinoids in the endocannabinoid system or do you think we're a tip of the iceberg there's so many more that we would have to learn about before we could even formulate with these ingredients talk about that there there's 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 definitely many many more endocannabinoids um, I, I was just going to say, on, on touching on the, the cake analogy or, or metaphor, um, we've gotten really uh, focused or fixated on um, single molecule solutions. I mean, that's what the entire premise of the pharmaceutical industry has been built upon. Um, but what I would say is, let's look back um, through history and, and uh, try to remember where that the idea of using single molecules to solve problems comes from. Um, and I just, I would... I would say, first of all, that 
way, way, way back when, like we're talking thousands of years ago, um, women were revered as the healers of their villages and the, like, the witches uh, who were brewing a bunch of different things in a pot and coming up with solutions to fix people. Um, they were not really focused on extraction or isolation, which is, we've taken that direction of, we've taken the, the opposite direction, right? Mixing a bunch of things together to, like, let's extract and, like, pinpoint exactly uh, one thing only. Um, and now I want to talk about, well, where did that come from? Well, we started creating universities and institutions. I think the earliest record is back in, like, 1100. And uh, I want to talk about who was barred specifically from attending university or institutions. Um, women. Uh, and so, so since typically women were the healers of their villages, all of a sudden universities, you had to have a university degree in education in order to be considered a medical practitioner. And that has lasted up until right now, our 21st century. Um, and so since women were barred from these institutes, all of a sudden they were labeled as you know, the negative, uh, negatively connota connoted, connotated uh, witch and hunted down to almost extinction in many places. Um, so what survived from that knowledge that they had of the healing traditions with many, many different types of herbs and fungi and, and other types of constituents? Well, um, almost nothing. So we're really just rediscovering that knowledge that we lost with trying to you know, mass persecute and prosecute women healers. Um, we're rediscovering that now with the quote unquote ensemble effect. And I think that's something special that the cannabis plant has brought to light again that, uh, that we had forgotten. We had gotten fixated on single molecules and forgotten that our food is our medicine. And I think that's something that cannabis has brought back to light again. We, should, we, we were eating a lot of it uh, previously throughout the course of humanity, and all of a sudden it was erased from our diet with the widespread uh, oppression and repression that came from um, you know, cannabis prohibition uh, worldwide. Um, so, and the, you know, the single conventions and so on uh, at the UN level. So um, I think it's really interesting if you look at, at that timeline and you recognize, recognize the fact that just now in the 20th century were women finally able to start attending universities for the first time in hundreds of years and all of a sudden uh, we're coming back to this, uh, this multi-molecular approach. It's not a coincidence that all of this is happening at the same time. It's not a coincidence that the world is on the verge of total catastrophic breakdown. Um, it's, it's not a coincidence, this, it's a coincidence that all of this is, is kind of coming to a head right now. That is a very interesting point. You just opened my mind. Because I didn't <laughs> see the... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trained as like a quote-unquote traditional uh, university chemist or biologist and I perhaps as a man sort of took contention with this whole idea of the entourage effect because to me it's smacked of unscientific that at least w if we do each individual molecule then we can know for sure you know with a test, vector test, test, and test, a direction test, test. and a penis Should be good. I can just know exactly what each one is, and it progresses scientifically like a glacier in a very dominant male chauvinist way. I never even realized that, that, that my thinking was so affected that way. Um, what, uh, we're wrapping up. Are you at a loss for words? I am at a loss for words. Um, I guess well, uh, <laughs> we could have boys team, girls team for uh, entourage effect versus individual cannabinoids, but I'm not sure that, that debating that would be progressive or d would help us get anywhere. Any last thoughts? We're uh, wrapping up now. I do think it would be, uh, your, your question that you posed was interesting about do we need to fully understand the endocannabinoid system and endogenous um, cannabinoids to uh, use it as medicine and uh, the answer is no uh, because we the cannabinoid receptors themselves only have the name cannabinoid receptors because it was cannabis uh, constituents that led to the discovery of these receptors and uh, I think that we'll continue to see that as we study more uh, cannabinoids individually we may discover receptors that are as of yet unknown which would be very exciting so
All right. Any other last thoughts, panel? Well, briefly to your question about the endocannabinoid system and what we might further discover, I think it's interesting. Please lean in. Thank sorry, you. Sorry, I think it's interesting to still consider the downstream effects of agonist or antagonist of the what's been identified as the endocannabinoid system and how that affects what they're tied to. So mm. there can be very complex relationships in the body. One enzyme may reach down to the toe if it starts in the ear, mm. and we will look at that. It's just that should be something quite interesting to discover would be the enzyme-enzyme interactions from a single group of, of cannabinoids. Thank you. All right, well, uh, thank you, panel. Thank you for your discussion. Any and thank, thank you all for attending. And um, I think we're just a minute early, and you can go on to your next discussion. Have a, have a good expo, everyone.